Also, the um, quizzes are graded. I think if, if you've looked at Skyward, you can see what you've got. There's one person from each class that needs to take it. So hopefully that will happen before class tomorrow. I can open it up real quick. You can see if you missed any. Overall, they were pretty good. So it shouldn't take too much time to go over them, but I want to wait until those two people have gotten it taken care of. The cumulative assignment is also graded. It's on Skyward. If you went to Canvas, you can then look and see if you missed any. Even if you got a 15 out of a 15, you still may have missed the sum. So you might want to look at it. On those assignments, those are the ones similar to some that I gave you earlier. I let you miss three before you start losing any points. And then if you miss five, it's a point. If you miss seven, it's another point, you know, so on and so forth. Nobody really gets beyond that point usually. But um, you can kind of see what any of those questions you may have missed. All right, so both of those, that you can see. And then I'll open up the quiz hopefully tomorrow if I can get those two people to get those quizzes taken um, before class. All right, so we should be looking at this 6.1 day note, day one notes in the packet. The first two things is a little review of what you quizzed on yesterday. So in terms of, let me cross my fingers that this is actually going to work. There's two different ways we currently know how to do a definite integral. The first way is, let's say I gave you this, and then our function value is a constant, where we can just do the function value of 10. The difference in x in this case is a 3. We can just say that's a 30 very quickly. So that's one way we can do it. The other way that we can do it is by using area as long as they're geometric shapes. So yesterday you had two different triangles. We did one where we had like a quarter circle. We can use geometry formulas. So that's what these two are. Just a quick little review. If I ask you what the value of this one is, it's three times our difference in x. Our difference in x would be three. So that has a value of nine. So number one, we can use this first method. It's a constant. We just multiply it by our difference in x. Number two, we would graph this. This is the one that we did in our notes the other day where we have the line y equals x plus a 3. So y-intercept of 3, slope of 1. We only want to go from 0 to 2. And we can break this into some geometric shapes, a little geometry here. So our rectangle had an area of 6. Triangle had an area of 2. So this would have had an area of 8. <clears throat> Currently, those are our two methods. What we eventually want to get to is, if we're not so restricted by simply a constant, or something that would give us a geometric shape. So that if we ever got to a problem like this one, so this now says, if you were given this integral to evaluate, then we're gonna have a bit of a problem because this is obviously not a constant, cosine x minus a two x. And if we graphed this, that is not a graph we're gonna be able to break up and create these nice geometric shapes with. So long-term, we wanna be able to come up with a method that works for not only these two really quick and easy ones, but the more complicated ones. And that's what 6.1 and, and the rest of this chapter now builds towards. <clears throat> So for number three, I give you the graph of y equals 2x. So that's the equation that you are going to look at. Using the idea of area that we did at the top of the page, I want you to evaluate this integral. And notice how I deliberately have this open-ended. I don't give you the upper limit there. So we're going to go from 0 to 0, 0 to 1, 0 to 2, 0 to 3, 0 to 4. So we're going to change our upper limit each time. And I'm going to do it from 0 to 3. And then you're going to set up an XY chart. That's actually how I kind of want you to do it. Put the XY chart in the middle. And then the values that I'm asking you, okay, it's not a good start, are 0, 1, 2, and then 3. And actually, don't call this Y. No, I'm not doing this. What we're going to be plugging in is the value from 0. Okay, zero better for the function 2x dx, and then the upper limit we don't know. That's what you're going to be plugging in. All right, and we're going to be plugging in the values on the left. All right, so for the first one, you're going to take this x value as zero. We're going to make that our upper limit. Think about what that means in terms of area. I would be looking for the area from zero to zero. So think about how much area we would accumulate if I'm having a difference of x from 0 to 0, all right? Hopefully we would all agree that that area would have to be a 0 itself. What I then want you to do is to take this new point, the x-coordinate I gave you, and then the area underneath this curve, let's plot that on our new graph. So over here, this is going to be the graph of the area under 
y equals 2x. <clears throat> All right, so the next one, let x be a 1. So now I'm going to change my upper limit here from a 0 to a 1. Now I can accumulate a little area here. So I'm going to get this triangle. It has a base of 1, a height of 2, so that's 2. We want half of that. So that area of that triangle would be a 1. So when x was a 1, we get the area underneath y equals 2x to also be 1. Plot that point. All right. If we go to two, oops, let me get rid of this. So now I'm gonna go over here to the X value of two. So here to here, so that's my new upper limit. So let's change this to a two. This now is a base of two, height of four, so that's eight, half of eight is four. So when X was two, we got an area of four. So plot two, four. And then the last one that I wanted you to do is if X is a three, so I'm not gonna change my upper limit to be a three. My triangle gets a little bit bigger now. So I go from here to here. The triangle now is a three by six, so that's 18. Half of 18 is nine. So the area here would be a nine. Plot that point. So all I am doing I'm finding the area underneath this curve, and then that area is producing different points or different y values at the same x coordinates that we were finding for the original graph. All right, so here's 2x. <clears throat> this is the area under 2x. So then when I ask you, write an equation for the graph on the right. So if I ask you to write an equation for this graph, you could really, it's probably easier to use the table. If we look at 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9, it's probably actually easier to write your equation that way. Either way, see what you think the equation of the graph on the right would be. And the reason I think it's easier, if we follow this pattern 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9, if I were to ask you what we would get at 4, we could probably all predict sort of what we're going to get at 4, I would hope. All right, would we all agree that's going to be 16? Because this equation should simply be 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is a 9, or a 16. This should just be my y value is always the x value squared. So understand what just happened. The area underneath y equals 2x produces the graph of y equals x squared. All right. Number five, then, what is the relationship between the equation for the graph on the right, the one that we just wrote here, and the equation of y equals 2x, the graph on the left over there? So if we looked at those two equations now, and I ask you, what's the relationship between these two? What do we think? What's going on between 2x and then x squared? Yeah, CC. Uh, the y equals 2x is the derivative of uh, y equals x squared. Okay, so CC says that y equals 2x is the derivative of y equals x squared. <laughs> However, Let's think of it a different way, <clears throat> because didn't we actually start this? Wasn't this our first one? We started with 2x, and this was the second thing that we came up with. So we actually used 2x, and we ended up with x squared. So what we're going to also write, and the, what she wrote is 100% correct, but what we can also now think of is the way that we got y equals x squared and again, the way we got it was the area underneath the curve, right? Y equals x squared is the area underneath. But what we're going to write is y equals x squared. Instead of saying 2x is the derivative of x squared, we're going to say that y equals x squared is the, wait for it, let me spell it right first, the antiderivative, 
of y equals 2x. So we actually can get y equals x squared from finding the what we're going to call an antiderivative of the one that we started with. All right. And that's now what 6-1 builds into is the idea of an antiderivative. We've been building on that a little bit. We've talked about it with area, how the area, when it's in gallons per minute, bumps you up to gallons. It's similar now when we're dealing with just general functions and not just units. All right. So with that in mind, go to number six. And let's say I now gave you the set of directions that this is our derivative. So I'm giving you a derivative, and I now want you to think backwards and tell me what the original function would have had to have been. So this, instead of y prime, we're going to write this as y. Wouldn't the original function have to have a power of 3? If the derivative had a power of 2, I knew the original function has to have a power of 3. And then we're thinking, what was this coefficient? <clears throat> so that when I would take the derivative, I end up with a coefficient of 3 in the derivative. All right, and then would we all agree that it's simply a 1? You can test these. So like today, tomorrow, the quiz that you're going to take on the majority of these things, all of these can be tested very, very quickly. If I take the derivative of this, just look and see, does it give me the actual derivative that I'm telling you needed to get? All right, and it should. All right, so number seven. If I ask you, what is this original function? If the original power is a cube, or the derivative power is a cube, then that means the original exponent had to have been a 4. And then think 4 multiplied by what would have given us a 4 for the coefficient. And this also would have had to have been a 1. And no, you don't have to write the 1. This one's a little more thought. This would have had to have had a power of 3 if the derivative has a power of 2. So 3 multiplied by what would have given us a derivative coefficient of 1, right? And wouldn't that then have to be 1 third? So that has to be the original function, all right? Now, with these, you just think backwards. Number 8 is pretty straightforward. Just think backwards. That's why we need to know our derivatives really, really well over the next week. You're just thinking, what did I take the derivative of? that would have given me a positive cosine. So just be careful with the pluses and the minuses. Your y had to have been regular old sine of x. Now, usually six, seven, and eight people get without a big deal. Uh, right now, what you think number nine would be? This actually should be, mm, no, I didn't give you one of these on the cumulative assignment, not this exact one. Okay, anybody feeling smart? I want to show off a little bit. What would this original function have to be? Yeah, somebody popped in. Yeah, go ahead, Eva. The inverse tangent of x plus z. That a girl, Eva. Should be the inverse tangent of x. If you remember all those weird derivative rules for inverse sine, I gave you the inverse sine on that cumulative assignment. We didn't do this in a while, but the derivative of the inverse tangent we said is 1 over 1 plus u squared. u is always the inside, so in this case it's just x squared. So you're going to need to remember pretty much every derivative we've done so far this year, we need to recall because now they're all going to come back. All right. 10, 11, 12, 13, do those. Now I'm giving you the, I want you to find the derivative. I'm giving you the original function. Won't get any easier than this, all right? All right, do we all get, do we get the same thing for all of those, right? So pretty simple, not a trick question. Those all have the derivative of 6x. 
the reason I am giving you these now, let's say I ask you to do with this problem right here, what I had you do in these first four. If I had you just think backwards, if I had asked you, what did we take the derivative of to get a 6x, we would have known that the x would have had a power of 2. And then the original function would have had to have had a power of, or a coefficient of 3. So that 2 times 3 would give us a 6, and then we get the x squared. Well, think about it if I did with this one. If I ask you to work backwards from this one, wouldn't that also mean we have an x squared here? And then the original coefficient would have had to have been a 3. And if I do that for all of them, wouldn't all of them produce the exact same original function? The issue is, were all four of these original problems that we took the derivative of, were those all the exact same function? No, because they all have this different constant that we have at the end. And when we take the derivative of a constant, every single constant produces a derivative of zero. So when we work backwards from zero, couldn't zero really be an infinite number of possibilities now? Yeah, but there's no way for us to know what that C was. All right, so that's problematic. So in number six, seven, eight, and nine, really couldn't there have been some sort of a number or a constant at the back of all of these that we just are not able to get back? Yes, so we need to acknowledge that. All right, we need to make it aware that, yeah, there's probably a constant in there. We just don't know what it is. So what we do with that, if you kind of look now down here, um, if I now reference an indefinite integral, so here's how this is different than what you just quizzed on. Here's our integral sign, but notice how there is no longer an upper limit or a lower limit. That's a definite integral if we know what we're going to go in between. Without these being here, now we don't know the interval. We're looking for our area underneath, so that's an indefinite integral. And what an indefinite integral implies up at the top here, it is asking you to find the antiderivative of whatever function we are looking for. Because what we showed on the front page, this is an indefinite integral because we didn't know what our upper limit was. I didn't give you that. And what we found on the, up, on the front page here is as I start to find the area underneath this curve, if I start evaluating this indefinite integral, that area gives us the antiderivative 100% of the time. All right? So whenever you see an indefinite integral, it's just asking you for your antiderivative. So evaluating an indefinite integral, the one that's easiest to understand is actually the second one because you're going to see the little tick mark here. So if I give you the indefinite integral of some derivative, that's just asking you to find the original function like we did at the top of the page. But then do account for the fact that there was probably some constant that we don't know. What you have to do to acknowledge that is you're going to put a little plus C and all that C stands for is the constant of integration that we just don't know the value of. There's no way for us to know what that would have been, at least not currently, there isn't a way. All right, now the, sec the first way, this is a regular old F. So if I gave you regular F and I ask you to find the antiderivative, the way we're gonna show that we've actually found the antiderivative if we're just dealing with these general terms is you're just gonna change the case. So notice how this is a lowercase F, if we change that to a capital F, that means that's the antiderivative of the lowercase f, in case we don't know what the actual function is going to be, okay? Then, we have what's called a power rule for antiderivatives, and it's basically what you did in your head up here. So let me make this less messy, and then you can see what this power rule was. It's pretty much what you did in your head up here. So let me get rid of those couple. So the power rule of integration is basically when we do anti also, I'll talk about this a lot, the word anti pretty much means the opposite. So whatever we would have done in a derivative, the antiderivative means you're going to do the opposite of what we do in a derivative, all right? So in a derivative, don't we subtract one from our power? So in an antiderivative, we had to add one to our power. In a derivative, we would have multiplied by this exponent. So in an antiderivative, instead of multiplying by that exponent, we're going to divide by that exponent. So let me bring number number 11 down, or I'm no, sorry, number 7 down, 4x cubed minus x squared. 
instead of thinking this through, we can just do our power rule. So I'm going to put an indefinite integral in front of these. And when I do the indefinite integral of my derivative, that means I'm going to get the original function. And then now think this power rule through. The power rule is telling us to add one to the original power. So I'm going to take that x cubed. I'm going to add one to it. And then whatever this original power is, the n plus one, I'm going to divide by that new power of four. Don't those cancel out and give us the x to the fourth that we got up in number seven? If I do that with the next one, I'm going to take the x squared. I'm going to add one to that power. Whatever this new power is, I then divide by that power. Isn't that the same exact thing we got up in number seven? Yeah, but now we can just kind of do it a lot quicker. It's a little more formalized. And then we now know we also have to put a plus C. This next quiz, depending on how I write it, if you have to fill it in, typically people are writing them in. It's not multiple choice and it's not online. People tend to forget the plus C. There's usually one person who forgets it on like every single question on this next quiz. So don't be that person because it'll be a lot of points off. All right. So all of these require this constant of integration. And then all we're doing now today is just some of these antiderivatives. So for number one, when we see this indefinite integral, that's implying we want to find the area infinitely underneath this curve. We don't want to have to do what I did on the front page. That takes forever. We now just have these little shortcuts where I'm going to add one to the new to the power. So my new power is a three. Whatever the new power is, I divide by it. And then we acknowledge that there was probably a constant in the original function that we don't know. So we put the plus C. Two, same thing. We would get four, add one to the power. So X cubed. And then that new power we divide by. And then we just do it term by term by term. So we can go ahead and do the antiderivative of 2x, which would initially be 2x squared, but then the new power of 2 we divide by. If you can do that without having to show it, feel free. Eventually you will. So as soon as that happens, no need to show the 2 and the 2. Plus, and then this one, there's different routes you could take. I think it's just easiest to think through what would we have taken the derivative of that would have given us just a regular old act or a regular old 1 as I jumped the gun a little bit. And then that should have been just x. The derivative of x would give us a one. Add your c, and then that should be our answer. Now, with these, just like with derivatives, I would strongly recommend rewriting this real quick with a negative exponent, especially now that sometimes when you do a derivative, you're subtracting one from the power, and I derivative, you're gonna add one. It's just really easy to mess up your sign. So I would take a second, oops, rewrite this, and then go through with your power rule. So bump that up, x to the negative 2 plus your 3. So then we do x, add 1 to this power. Again, be careful with the negatives. I see a lot of really careless mistakes with negatives. If I add 1 to the negative 2, I should get a power of a negative 1. And then I've got to divide by that new power. And then think through what would we have taken the derivative of to get a regular old 3, and that would have had to have been a 3x. Add your constant. I wouldn't expect you to rewrite this with positive exponents, so negative 1 over x plus 3x plus c. That should be our final answer for that one. Four, similar, I'm going to take this x cubed. I want to bump it into the numerator. And then it's just, again, the power rule for antiderivatives. So again, it's just the opposite of what we do derivatives. Derivatives, we subtract one from the exponent. So the antiderivative, you're adding one. So we get 4x to the negative 2. Derivatives, we multiply by that exponent. Antiderivatives, we divide. Minus, so now again, if, if most people, it doesn't take long. If we think ahead of this step, this would be 2x squared divided by 2. And then those 2s will cancel. So we just get a minus x squared. And then what we took the derivative of to get a 1 is just an x. And then plus our c. As always, I'm out of room with my big giant online pen. But you would want to simplify this to make sure that that's a negative exponent. 
So you'd write that as a negative 2 over x squared, and then the rest of this would stay the same. That's the power rule for antiderivatives. Pretty simple. Nothing tricky. You just want to keep everything straight now, now that we can do derivatives and antiderivatives. So when we now go to our trig functions, don't be doing power rules here. You're just thinking backwards when we start dealing with trig functions. So we just want to think, if I had a positive cosine of x, what did we take the derivative of to get a positive cosine of x? And that should be a positive sine of x. Same thing with a positive sign. You're just thinking through, what would I have taken the derivative of that would have given me a positive sign? And again, be very careful. A lot of little sign errors with these. This should be a negative cosine. The derivative of cosine is a negative sign. So if we have a positive sign, that means our cosine would have been negative. And then plus our constant. Six. Some kids, hopefully none of the 32 people here now, get tempted because they see a power right here to start doing power rules with this and start thinking this is like a secant cubed over a three. That would be bad. All right, the power rule doesn't apply to our trig functions. We haven't had to do this in a while. I think maybe I gave you one of these on that assignment you just did, but you're just thinking, what did we take the derivative of to get a secant squared? And we actually have a direct antiderivative, it would be tangent. The derivative of tangent gives you secant squared. All right. And then the next one, you would do a 4x squared divided by a 2. Add your constant. And then obviously, you can reduce that 4 divided by 2 down to a 2x squared. All right. Do 7 and 8 real quick. Yeah, those are the last couple that I have on here. And the only reason I want you to do those is it's really easy to make the little positives and negatives error when we're dealing with the sines and cosines. So just do 7 and 8 real quick. Make sure we keep our signs straight. <clears throat> All right, let's see how we did here. Uh, Steve, what do you think for number seven? What'd you get? I got negative cosine of x plus 3x plus c. Good. So the derivative of cosine is a negative sign. So since we have a positive sign, that meant our cosine had to be negative. All right. All right. And eight, uh, Terrence, you got both of them to deal with. What did you get for the antiderivative of negative cosine? Would have been what? Negative sine x. Good. So that has to be a negative sign. And then a negative sign would be what? Positive cosine x. Good. And then you remember. Plus good. And then our plus e. So just be careful because the derivative of cosine is a negative sign. The antiderivative of cosine is going to be a positive sign. So it's easy to get those things mixed up, especially as I start to you get problems where you're doing both. You just want to make sure that we're thinking that through. All right, last one. Radicals, definitely rewrite these. Again, it takes a second to rewrite these as your fraction powers. So review that a little bit. Make sure you remember how to rewrite radicals as fractions. Your denominator is your index number, so that's why this index number of 2 is your denominator, and index number here of 3 is your denominator, and then the exponent of the variable is your numerator. From there, it's the same thing we've been doing. 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves, and then we divide by that new power, so divide by 3 halves. Add 1 to 1 third, that should be 4 thirds and then divide by that new power. And then what we took the derivative of to get 2 would be a 2x. Add your constant. And then you wouldn't leave this. 
And as you get better, you probably are already thinking, can I just do this right off the bat? Feel free. Understanding that if we divide by two thir or three halves, that's the same as multiplying by two thirds. So we could just jump right to two thirds x to the three halves. And then this would have been three fourths x to the four thirds plus two x and then plus r c. In general, the higher order fractional powers like this, I would just leave those. If it's a square root, typically I would rewrite them as the square root. But you can just leave this as three halves and four thirds. The only issue, it becomes a lot of algebra is the issue you come up with. So if you were to write this as a square root of x cubed, can't this then actually be simplified even further? You can pull out a set of one set of squares. We don't need to go that in depth with all of this in terms of simplifying it. So we can just leave this as a three halves and then that one is a four thirds. All right. Simple enough, hopefully. So that's kind of our first little experience with antiderivatives is the power rule and then just understanding our trig derivatives, how we can go backwards from those. All right, that's pretty much it. Let me point something out to you, though, just in case you wanted to get a little bit of a head start. So tomorrow we're going to do 6.1 day two. There is an assignment that goes with that. You could do probably half of that assignment right now if you wanted to get a head start on that. But this will be due on Monday, ultimately. It's up to you when you want to start it. But that's where you can find it. It's also in here underneath the assignments. So if you wanted to do the ones that you can get done, feel free. You will have a hard time with about half of them because that's what we do tomorrow. But it is very much the same thing what we do tomorrow, just thinking backwards. And then we'll, tomorrow we'll do like inverse sine, inverse tangent, inverse cosecant, all the random ones, the ones that we haven't done a whole lot of, natural logs, exponential functions. But if you wanted to get started on that, you could. But that's all I got. We can actually finish early. I don't have to feel like I have to race through the class for once. All right. Um, that's why I was actually going to do a video of this, but it wasn't working because it's pretty short and sweet. Okay. So if you have any questions on anything, let me know. But I don't need to keep you around for the next eight minutes. Okay. Everything we needed to cover, we, we did. All right. So check out. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a good day. Stop recording.